Hey kids, Miss Janae here. Our story this week is Jesus and Nicodemus. But first let's talk about our memory verse. You guys, so easy. This month is John 3:16. I know you can all do it because I'm pretty sure probably half of you already have it memorized. It's so easy and it's such an important one. So dive into your scripture, open your Bible, find John 3:16 and memorize it. Uh, once you guys say it, you guys can send me a text message or post it on social media. Um, and once I see that video, I will send you a card in the mail with a ticket in there that will be good for a prize from the treasure box. So let's dive into our lesson. But first, I want to show you guys a video of Frankie Freed saying his memory verse. For God to love the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have an everlasting life. Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover feast, and one night a religious man came to see him. His name was Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which meant he knew the law, he studied it, and he even taught the law. He tried to obey the law the best that he could, and he wanted to know more about Jesus. So he came up to Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from the Lord. No one can do the miracles that you do unless they are from God. And Jesus responded and said, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he has been born again. Now this confused Nicodemus. What? And it confused him because he was under the impression and believed that if he obeyed the law to the best of his ability, that that would get him into heaven, into the kingdom of God. And besides, he said, how can a man that is old be born again? And Jesus said, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born of both water and spirit. Because whatever is spirit gives birth to spirit and whatever is flesh gives birth to flesh. When a baby is born, he gets his physical life from his parents, but that life doesn't last forever. The spirit gives life that is better, a spiritual life that gives life forever with God. Jesus said, don't be surprised. I tell you, you must be born again. Well, Nicodemus still did not understand. And he asked him, I, I, don't, I don't get this. I'm confused by this. And Jesus reminded him of a story that Nicodemus knew well because he studied the Bible and he knew scripture. And he reminded him about a time, and it's actually found in Numbers, where the Israelites are in the desert and they sinned against God and God was so tired of their sinful nature and, and them just disobeying him that he sent some serpents, some venomous snakes into the camp to bite them and, some, and they were dying. And they cried out to Moses, please save us, please save us. And so Moses went to God on the Israelites' behalf and God told Moses to take a pole and to set up a bronze snake and to, to lift it up in camp. And anyone who looked at this snake would be saved and they would be healed. And just like that, Jesus said, just like Moses raised up the bronze snake in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. And he went on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So you see, you guys, Nicodemus needed a new life. He needed a new spiritual life. And we are just like Nicodemus, that we need a new life. We are sinners and we cannot earn our way to heaven. And just like the Israelites looked up at the bronze snake on that pole and they were saved, we look to Jesus and we are saved. Isaiah talks about, look to me and you will be saved. And so we look to Jesus and by doing that, we talk about this all the time. We remain in Him. And remaining in God means studying our Bible. It means memorizing scripture. It means fellowshipping with other Christians and talking about the love of God. It means loving God and loving others. So this week, do that. Thank you for joining us this week, you guys. We're gonna be posting your stories every single week, so be looking for those. In the meantime, I wanna hear about you. I wanna know what you guys are doing during this quarantine. I know we're doing things that we don't normally do, and so I wanna see what you guys are doing. Um, 
We are dancing to, to worship music. Some of our kids just had a new sibling that they welcomed into the world. Uh, Wendy, Wendy Freed even adopted a duck. Pretty cool stuff happening in children's ministry. So share what you've been up to. All right, guys, see you next week. Ten thousand years and then forever more. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship is holy. Good morning, Riverview Church. It's Sunday, May 24th. It's Memorial Day weekend, and this is an amazing time for us to remember those that gave their lives so that we could worship freely in this country and enjoy the many freedoms that we have here in America. Thank you to all the families that have relatives, loved ones that gave their lives for this country. And this weekend is a time for us to remember that. We're glad you're here. We've, we're glad you've joined us this morning. We want to remind you that we have our Riverview Church app. If you haven't downloaded it, please do that. We have our uh, sermon notes on this app. You can watch the sermon on the app itself. There are uh, prayer requests. You can share a prayer request with us on the app. Also, you can give online. So thank you, Riverview Church, for giving to the work of Riverview. What we're trying to do here is lift up the name of Jesus. So thank you for being behind that. Uh, this has been such a blessing to sense your support during this very difficult COVID-19 virus pandemic. We love you, Riverview Church. Can't wait until we meet again. And by the way, uh, we are going to be meeting June 14th on our campus. That's our day to regather, to reopen. And uh, I know that on Friday, President Trump announced that churches are considered essential services. We knew that all along, amen? We knew that churches were essential and he announced it to the whole nation and uh, said that churches could meet. But we're still going to meet uh, for the first time on June 14th. And we believe that's the best move as elders for our church. As you know, we're a multi-generational church. We have a number of seniors that attend our church. We want to make sure they're safe. Kids, as you know, find it very difficult to socially distance. They run up to each other and hug each other. So we want to give it a little more time. And please don't think that this is being fearful. We just want to do the wise thing. I want to ask you, did you ever put on a seatbelt before it was the law? I know I did. You might say, well, Mel, you were being fearful. No, I was just taking what I believe to be wise safety precautions, right? So I put on a seatbelt. That's what I want to do as a pastor. That's what we want to do as elders. We want to take wise safety precautions that makes our time of worship together as safe as possible. That's why for at least a few weeks, we're going to meet outside under tents, in the shade. We'll have our music outside. It'll be church in the park. So please pray about that. We're excited about that. We look forward to gathering with you. You can bring your own favorite lawn chair if you want. We'll have chairs there for you. If you don't bring your own, but it's going to be a great time. We can social distance as much as we want. But June 14th is the day. So God bless you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity we have to continue to be the church even though we are being hit by this pandemic. We thank you for the progress that's been made in fighting this pandemic. We thank you for our frontline workers. We pray, God, that today we would take time to worship you. And now as we worship with songs, Lord, I pray that our hearts would enter in and that we would lift you up in our hearts today. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in Jesus' matchless name and all God's people said, amen. Good morning, Riverview Church. Welcome to worship.
inside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Hey, a couple of announcements. If you are a military wife, we are having a military wives fellowship here at Riverview Church led by Nitsa Rents. Her email will be on the bottom of the screen. So contact her. It'll be a meeting of military wives via Zoom. If you want to be a part of that, then uh, contact Nitsa. Her email is on the screen. And by the way, this is Memorial Day weekend. We are so thankful for the freedoms that we have. We're so thankful for our veterans, for those that are serving today in the military, in every branch of the military, protecting our freedoms. But this weekend, we are so thankful uh, for those that gave their lives to fight for our freedoms. And this is a video that reminds us of the price they paid so that we could enjoy the freedoms that we have today. Let's watch this video. It's a powerful video, and it reminds us of how precious our freedoms are. And the greatest freedom we have is the freedom that Christ gave us by laying down his life for us on the cross. Let's talk to him right now before we get into the word of God. Jesus, thank you for what you have done for us. You set us free. And Lord, we know that those that you have set free are free indeed. God, I pray that as we open up your word, we would open up our hearts as well and be changed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in a series entitled Unstoppable, the story of the book of Acts, the birth and growth of the New Testament church. Last week, we talked about Acts chapter 9, Paul's conversion, this leader in the Jewish faith in Jerusalem that was going about persecuting Christians. He was on his way to Damascus, and on the way there, he encountered the risen Christ, and he was changed. He became totally new, and we talked about that last week, what it means to be changed by the power of Christ. My prayer would be every one of you would place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you know your salvation is not based on your good works, but on your faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And by placing your faith in Christ, you are made new again. And now your desire is to be like him. That's why you obey him, not to get heaven, but because you already received it. Hey, today, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about 2020 vision. 
Peter, in Acts chapter 10, has an amazing vision. A sheet coming down out of heaven. And I don't know about you, but I love when I can see well. About a year and a half ago, one of my eyes all of a sudden changed. I, I used to use reading glasses last few years, but all of a sudden my one eye, my right eye, uh, I couldn't see so clearly at a distance, but all of a sudden I could read clearly out of my right eye. And I didn't need my reading glasses anymore. I wasn't sure what happened. I even went to an eye doctor and I said, is there something wrong? All of a sudden I can't see that clearly at a distance, but I can read now. And I, I wasn't using my reading glasses for about a year. But I didn't like that feeling of not being able to have 20-20 vision. So what I did about two, three months ago, I had LASIK surgery in my right eye. And now I can see clearly. Both my eyes are the same again. I love having 20-20 vision. That's exactly what Peter got in Acts chapter 10 when he saw this sheet come down out of heaven. In fact, let me put on my reading glasses and read this passage. Cornelius, by the way, was a centurion. He was a Roman soldier that was in charge of a hundred soldiers. It says in Acts chapter 10 that he was in Caesarea. There was a man named Cornelius and Centurion who was of the Italian cohort. This is verse 1. A devout man who feared God. He was a believer in the God of the Jews. He, he believed in the Jewish God. Probably didn't go through all the temple ceremonies, but he believed in their God. And all his household did as well. They gave alms generously to people. They prayed continually to God. Already you love this guy, Cornelius. About the ninth hour of the day, which is about three in the afternoon, he saw clearly a vision of an angel of God come to him and say, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, Joppa was about 31 miles to the south of Caesarea. And bring one Simon, that was Peter, who was also called Peter. He's lodging with another guy named Simon, a tanner whose house is by the seaside, you know, overlooking the Mediterranean Ocean. Must have been a great view at his house. That's where Peter was, overlooking the Mediterranean in the town of Joppa. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants. So Cornelius called two servants, said, hey, I want you to go down and find this guy, Peter. And having relayed everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, while they were traveling down to Joppa, the next day, as they were journeying and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop. Back then, the houses generally had flat roofs. He was doing that about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing the meal, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And, and there came a voice to Peter saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And when the voice came to him again a second time, said this, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Let's talk about this event. This happens in the middle of our sections here in the book of Acts. Chapter 10, right? In the second section, we've been going through that. So we have an understanding of where we are in the book of Acts. And the bottom line of our talk today is this. The power of the cross is clearly displayed in the freedom that the cross gives us from all of the requirements of the Old Testament law and the freedom that is offered to all who receive it. My prayer would be today that every one of you know what happened when Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross and rose again. It gave us incredible freedom. Freedom from the requirements of the law. All the ceremonial washings, all the offerings that the Jews needed to partake in. 
We don't have to do that anymore. Why? Because of the power of the cross. And if you have your Bibles, let's look at chapter 10 and what happens here. This sheet comes out of heaven and, and a voice speaks to Paul, a Peter, and says, Peter, arise, kill and eat. And Peter says, in essence, yuck, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean or common. God, I've never eaten this stuff, and I'm not going to start now. But we see the words of the Lord to Peter. It says this, what God has made clean, do not call common. Peter, when the Lord tells you to do something, don't question it. Don't question it. Yes, there is a change, right? All these animals that you never ate before, Peter, are now clean. Uh, the requirements of the Old Testament law, these requirements, for example, in Leviticus 11, if you turn there, you'll see the dietary restrictions that were laid upon the Jews by the Lord. It was for their own good, for their health. But now the Lord was removing that. He was removing something that potentially could be seen as an obstacle, as a work that needed to be accomplished to be saved. Now, what you eat is ultimately up to you as a Christian. You may be a vegan today. I was for about five, six years. I now eat a little bit of meat in my diet. What you eat is up to you. You have the freedom to decide that. You don't have to follow the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament law. And what this vision shows us is this. Jesus brings an awesome freedom to the life of the believers. If you've read the Old Testament, especially the book of Leviticus, you know, number one, that's a hard book to read through. There are many dietary restrictions. There are many instructions about offerings that are given to the Jews. There are instructions to the priests about ceremonial washings and how they should be cleansed before they enter the temple. All of those are gone. All of those are gone. Why? Because of the power of the cross. Because of the power of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. This vision that came out of heaven with all these unclean animals. You can see them here. Peter's like, I I've never eaten these things. And I'm not going to start now. Hey, Peter, when God tells you you can do something, you can do it. Don't call common or unclean what God has made clean. See, here's the realization that Peter was discovering. The power of the cross, what? It changes everything. It changes everything. We now have direct access to God. We now, by the power of the cross, have God living within us. We are made priests and priestesses in the kingdom of God. See, the death of Christ for you on the cross changes everything. When you look at the old covenant, the old covenant of the law, very different than the new covenant. In fact, let me review it for you. The old covenant was given in the book of Exodus through Moses at Mount Sinai. God made a conditional covenant with the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. If you obey me, I will bless you. And I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. God wanted to bless the people of Israel. But they had certain requirements that they needed to fulfill. It was given to them by Moses. The new covenant is given through Jesus. Much better, amen? This new covenant, a covenant of grace, not of the law. The freedom that we have in Christ, uh, grace, is a wonderful acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. That we are given all of these blessings by God through this new covenant that Jesus established. Remember when Jesus had his last supper with the disciples and he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I have people that turn the, to the Old Testament and say, hey, Mel, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? There's a requirement here that uh, is in the Old Testament. Why aren't Christians doing that? Because it's the Old Covenant. We are no longer under the covenant of the law. We are under grace. That's the whole theme of the book of Romans. Paul writes that as the theme of the entire book. 
We're not under the law. We're under grace. We've been given freedom. Here's the next thing. The old covenant written on stone, right? At least the Ten Commandments were. But the new covenant, the Bible says, is written on our hearts. God writes that covenant in our hearts. It's an imperfect high priest. It was a human high priest. Aaron was one, but there were many others. They were imperfect. The new covenant, Jesus is our perfect high priest and can identify with everything that we're going through. Isn't that good to know? He went through everything we experience. All those categories of temptation he experienced, yet without sin. Perfect high priest. That old covenant of the law of sin and death, and by the way, the law was simply a tutor to teach us how much we needed a Savior. It never was intended to save us. It was a tutor to show how far we have fallen from God's standard. But the new covenant is the law of the spirit of life, that through Christ and his sacrifice, we are made alive. We're not under the requirements of the law any longer. The law is now dead to us, and we are dead to the law. No power over us because of Christ. The old covenant was a law of works. The new covenant, a law of grace. In the old covenant, many sacrifices and regulations, many, many. But in the new covenant, they're taken away. They're gone. It's, it's one sacrifice that gave us freedom, that opened up access to us to have direct communion with God, to cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. I hope you feel that freedom today. And that's really what that sheet was intended to convey to Peter. Peter, things have changed under Jesus. Don't try to follow the works of the law. That doesn't save you. In fact, it was intended to point you to Jesus and your need for a Savior. And that's what everyone who has placed his or her trust in Jesus has discovered. That you have a Savior in Jesus Christ who paid the price for your sins. And by faith in him, you're forgiven. You don't have to worry about whether my good works outweigh my bad and will I be accepted by God and am I going to go to heaven when I die? John wrote these words, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. See, this sheet that was lowered from heaven was telling Peter those requirements of the Old Testament, those regulations are now all fulfilled in Christ. We don't have to go through all those ceremonial washings and all of those sacrifices to be right with God. We trust in the one sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. In the old covenant, they had that yearly atonement, right, for the sins of the nation of Israel. Do you remember what that day is called? Yom Kippur, right? Day of atonement. The Jews still celebrate that day today. But that atonement has been totally fulfilled by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, a once-for-all sacrifice. So, so Peter gets this vision, but it has a deeper meaning than even dietary restrictions. Because look what the text says. As this vision disappears after appearing three times, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had had might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, he was thinking about, what does this vision mean? The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one who, you, who you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to the house, and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them to be his guests. All of a sudden, I think Peter began to realize this vision had more to do with people than animals. 
This vision was about God making these Gentiles, this Cornelius, Roman centurion, a Gentile, that he too would be in the kingdom of God, that God was making Gentiles, people that Jews saw as unclean. They too would be made clean by faith in Jesus Christ. The next day he rose and went away, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius, expecting them, called them together, his relatives and close friends. He, he brought all of his relatives and family and friends to his house to hear Peter. When Peter entered, Cornelius met and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. Good move, Peter. It would be blasphemy to receive worship, right? Only God is to be worshipped. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation, a Gentile. It's not lawful. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why you've sent for me? See, what God was doing for this, in this vision was to prepare the heart of Peter. He began to understand what it was all about. It's this. Jesus calls us to a heartfelt obedience to his awesome revelation. That what God tells us in his word is that God will call people from all tongues, tribes, and nations together. He will make them clean by the powerful sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. See, the realization is this, that when God reveals in his word what the truth of the gospel is, we have to obey it. We have to follow it. And there may be some people even listening today who've trusted in their works, in their efforts. But I want you to know today that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross changes everything. It's by faith in Him that you're forgiven. It's by faith in Him that you can be set free. You can experience the freedom that only God can give. But it demands obedience to say, yes, Lord, I reject my old way of thinking and I follow you. That's exactly the transformation that was needed in Peter's life. And then the next important lesson here is this. Jesus reveals that his amazing grace is available to all. Even to this Gentile Cornelius, this Roman centurion, that God loved Cornelius just as much as he loved Peter. And Cornelius would become part of the family of God. Let me read this amazing passage as we look at verse 44. I'm going to skip over the description that Peter gives of Christ and his sacrifice. Verse 44 of Acts 10. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. See, as Peter shared the gospel with Cornelius, Cornelius came to faith in Christ. Verse 34, Peter said this, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. God loves everyone. God loves everyone. And Cornelius places his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he receives the Holy Spirit just like they did in Acts chapter 2. That was a confirmation to Peter and all the Jews that were there, all those who were circumcised, that God had accepted the Gentiles just as they were. The Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and all those who believed in that house. Same way he did in Acts chapter 2 same manner and Peter knew that God shows no partiality see the key realization here with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 it includes everyone Cornelius hey by the way not enough to be just a God fearer 
you've now heard about Jesus Christ and the revelation of Jesus. Do you accept him or reject him? Thankfully, Cornelius and his household accepted Christ. He placed his faith in Jesus. It had fallen even on the Gentiles. Now, again, we've talked about the baptism of the Spirit. For every believer in in Jesus Christ, the baptism of the Spirit occurs at salvation. You're baptized into the body of Christ at the moment of salvation. But this occurs in this text to confirm to the Jews that the Gentiles are accepted just the way they are. In Acts chapter 15, there'll be a council to discuss, hey, wait a minute, these Gentiles are uncircumcised. They have to follow all these Jewish things to become Christians. And Peter says, no, not at all. When I was at Cornelius' house, he wasn't following the Jewish rituals. He wasn't circumcised, but God accepted him the way he was. And who are we to add any burden on these Gentiles? That's what happens in Acts chapter 15. We'll get there later. But that's how important it was for these Jews to see the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out even on the Gentiles. For when they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God, Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. God accepted them just the way they are. And as many of us are here in California, many of us are Gentiles. There's Jews and Gentiles. There are many Jews in the area as well. Many of uh, the Jews in this area, I've met a number of them, have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but I'm one of those Gentiles that have come to faith in Christ, and maybe you are too, that God accepted us just the way we are. That was the vision that God had from the very beginning. Remember when Abraham was called to be the father of a great nation? God said, through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He was referring to moments like this one when Cornelius of the Italian cohort would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Do you rejoice in that today? And by the way, this is another reminder that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross pays for whatever sin you've ever committed. Whatever sin you've ever committed. I, I say this often because it's so important for us to understand this, that the sacrifice of Christ covers every sin. There is no sin so great that it cannot be paid for by the death of Christ on the cross. There's no sin that great because the death of Christ on the cross, for you and me, it's a masterpiece. Can't improve on it. Can't make it better. It's God's masterpiece. And Acts chapter 10 is a key passage for us to understand that what Peter learned that day is freedom from the law. Do you understand that? It's not by legalism that you're saved, but by faith in Jesus, by, by Jesus making us alive again. The freedom of that, the freedom of that. Now, there are core doctrines that we believe, but... There's freedom in the body of Christ. Uh, there are some of you who may be saying, you know what, I, I like adhering to the Old Testament dietary laws. I, I know some people who try to live by some of the dietary restrictions in the Old Testament. That's fine, but you're not saved by that, right? You're not saved by that. We can learn from the Old Testament and the laws and regulations that God gave the Israelites under the law because it reveals to us the heart of God. But we're not under the law. Rejoice in that freedom today, my friends. So through the cross, we have Jesus' indwelling presence, right? Uh, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's an important doctrine to fully understand. Christ living in you. Here's another thing. You have sufficient power to do what God has called you to do. You can't say, I'm a believer in Christ, but I just can't do it. Uh, God, you're failing me somehow. 
No, God gives us the power to live the life. Ephesians 6.10 says this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's a reliance that you have on Christ. This independent dependence that you have on Christ. That yes, you have to walk the walk, but there's a moment by moment dependence on the power of Christ. Then we have the eternal promises that Jesus gives us. All these promises that are found in Christ, right? For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. God gives us amazing promises. The promise for Cornelius was this. If you place your faith and trust in Christ, you're forgiven. That promise was fulfilled. Cornelius is in heaven now, enjoying the presence of Christ forever and ever. And one day, you will meet him. This guy that's talked about here in Acts chapter 10. And then the last thing, through, through the cross, we have Jesus' perfect plan. What is that plan? That through Christ, we talked about this verse last week. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. All the requirements, all the works, they never save anyone. All that stuff passed away. Behold, in Christ, the new has come. And as we close today and contemplate Cornelius and what happened here in Acts chapter 10, and believe me, this is an important event in the growth of the church. This changes the way the church understands what the Old Testament is all about and how it relates to the church by what happened here in the life of Cornelius and his family as he prays to receive Christ. Understand the awesome impact of the new covenant on our lives as Christians. Understand what the covenant of grace is all about. Do you rejoice in grace today? Do you rejoice in that? It's an awesome gift that God has given to us. Secondly, revel in the freedom and responsibility you have in Christ. The last thing you want to do is take advantage of the freedom you have in Christ. The thing you want to do is say, Lord, I get that freedom now that I have, but I don't want to take advantage of that. I don't want to say, hey, if God is so good at forgiving me, I'll commit all these sins and I'll experience the forgiveness of God more and more in my life. No, you don't want to say that. That's taking advantage of the freedom God has given you. We have responsibilities when we come to Christ to be more and more like him every day because we want to be. We want to be like him. Here's the next now what. Don't abuse the freedom and access you have in Christ. Don't abuse that freedom. Follow Christ with a heart that says, Lord, I want to be like you. I know that things have changed from the old covenant to the new that Jesus established by his blood on the cross. But I'm not going to abuse that, that power, that freedom that I have in Jesus Christ. And then lastly, catch a vision for your part in God's greater plan. Peter caught that vision. He caught the vision of what God had called him to do to reach out not only to Jews, but to Gentiles as well. And that God was creating this new entity called the church, the body of Christ, that would be God's tool to change the world. You're part of it. Don't miss your part in it. And Riverview Church, I just want to challenge you again that even though we're not meeting, we can be that unstoppable church that makes a difference in the lives of our neighbors, that loves people that are unlovable, that reaches out to those who are needy and lives the way Christ would have us live. Hey, Riverview Church, love you. Can't wait until June 14th. Keep praying. And God bless you as you live this week. All for him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time. And I pray, God, that you would allow us to realize the freedom that we have in you. You set us free, Jesus. And we rejoice in that today. We give you all the praise because you deserve it. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you, Riverview.